O thou, majesty of Godhead, wisdom crowned to Hudi, lord of the gates of the universe, thee, thee I invoke. My word is accomplished every day, and the desire of my heart realizes itself as that of Ptah when he createth. I am eternal, therefore all things are as my designs, therefore do all things obey my word. I'm going to talk to you about writing. About writing in a magical record, magical diary, magical journal, magical something in which you work out, communicate, and preserve to refer to later, that by which you can better know and become yourself on the path of the Lima, toward your true will. Writing important stuff in a diary had always been a fascination of mine since young age, and interestingly, several years before crossing paths with the Lima and taking up magic as such, I had embarked on the practice of keeping a daily diary, which I maintained for a period of three and a half years without fail, my longest uninterrupted period of writing as of yet that has also overlapped with the most productive I've ever been. To the end of discussing writing, and given that we're all about magic here, it's nice to be reminded that Tehuti, which is the Egyptian version of the deity, or Thoth, Hermes, the Greek version, is not only the god of magic, but also that of writing. His being viewed as the scribe of the gods, the messenger of the gods, and or even the inventor of writing, depending on the specifics of the referent account. In fact, amidst meditating upon this correspondence, Crowley has called magic in general the art of communication, without obvious means. He's also referred to the diligent user and per-user of the magical record as the most ardent devotee of Tehuti. And it also can't be forgotten that it is Tehuti that stands in splendor at the prow in our solar adoration of Resh, his being depicted as leading all that follows, from the apprehension of thought to word to deed, all coming from a deeper source. Indeed, writing itself is a potent form of magic. Think about how grimoire comes from the French word for grammar, grammaire, itself from grammar, which is letter, or how spells allude to spelling. Yes, writing, the science of manipulating visible marks, symbols, characters, words, statements, images, and the like to achieve changes in a lot, in meaning, action, reality at large, including changes in your own and other states and modes of consciousness. Writing certainly wrought profound changes since its introduction into human history, since which there have usually been scribes around. In fact, in ancient Israel, so cared about was even the writing of the most holy name of yod heh vav -He, Yahweh, Jehovah, that scribes would be asked to swipe the pen and cleanse their entire body beforehand. With reference to a diary, Oscar Wilde has said, I never travel without my diary. One should always have something sensational to read on the train. And Jonathan Swift has marveled at how, it is a strange thing that it is in sea voyages, where there is nothing to be seen but sky and sea, that men should make diaries. But in land travel, where there is so much that to be observed and experienced, for the most part, the practice is omitted, as if chance were fitter to be registered than observation. Alistair Crowley views diaries as an invaluable, if not crucial, part in charting the great work. And finally, writing is not only communication, but communion, such as, especially in a diary, with your very own self, extending to your angel. So, how does one use a magical record to promote self-knowledge and ultimately the great work? In my segment, I'm first going to cover how self-knowledge is treated in research academic psychology, which is the field I'm involved in, in which self-knowledge has been accruing a lot of interest. This will be in comparison with and contrast to its conceptualization in Thelema, which is the field we're all involved in. Then, I'll go over the history of the diary, including its surge in the Protestant Reformation of the 16th-17th centuries. All of this will coalesce into Crowley's prescriptions regarding the use of a magical record and a discussion of how we do so in the Lima, including its pragmatic aspects. So, without further ado, in psychology, self-knowledge has been a very interesting subject of study. If you think about self-knowledge, and if you're trying to measure self-knowledge in other people, it seems to be a pretty simple issue. Self-knowledge is evidenced simply by someone who knows who he is. But therein lies the problem. From an operational standpoint, that is, from the standpoint of how to measure or index self-knowledge, you have to ask, how do we know who someone is in the first place? In psychology, we've mostly come up with this. Who you is is whittled down to your personality. That is, your characteristic motivations, aspirations, and especially your characteristic thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, as well as personality-independent aspects like level of intelligence, competence, and talents. 
How we measure self-knowledge is by looking at whether your conscious understanding of yourself matches up with, one, either objective measures dealing with all of the above, such as how much you talk in a conversation as a measure of your outgoingness, or two, others' opinions of who you are, that is the social consensus, which ostensibly matches up with reality. Do you think you're funny and others think you're funny? Ding! Self-knowledge. Do you think you're funny and others cry from ennui at your droney jokes? Hmm, self-knowledge circumspect, at least from a methodological measurement standpoint. In research psychology, we turn all of this into numbers and then proceed to come up with further numbers, such as whether your ratings of yourself correlate with others' ratings that were given about you. If the correlation is high, your level of self-knowledge is also high. Or we also look at directional discrepancies, that is to say, whether you tend to give yourself more or less favorable ratings than what are warranted by the evidence. If there's little discrepancy, you are said to be self-knowing. It's been scientifically demonstrated that most people, most of the time, see themselves through rose-colored glasses, protecting themselves and their feelings of self-worth by maintaining self-enhancing illusions. However, psychology studies have also shown that in the end, it is self-knowledge and not its warping that leads to the best outcomes. While a psychic defense might allow people to feel happy, even self-satisfyingly puffed up and arrogant in the moment, not having self-knowledge prevents the individual from being what Crowley would call in right relation with the universe. This can transfer to problems in relationships. If you're a real chump, to not getting a promotion at work because you impede group processes, and just making bad decisions for yourself. Those that truly know themselves, their strengths and limitations, fare better. Terribly apropos to the segment, research studies have also demonstrated that those who introspectively turn a pen to their thoughts and feelings, a line of research initiated by Pennebaker, and to constructing a cohesive narrative of who they are, research started by Mac Adams, also derive huge benefits, down to lower blood pressure, better immune functioning, higher GPA, and a greater sense of well-being. As you might know, Self-knowledge is a different, deeper animal in Thelema than what I previously described. Actually, it was really confusing for me at first because personality, while still not as perfectly measurable and even conceptualized as it yet can be in psychology, still seemed to me to centrally deal with the crucial essence of who a person is. But, personality is actually pretty peripheral. Veils that are like a t-shirt you're wearing and must see past or through to get to the good stuff. The cops is in the coup, not the coup in the cobs. Worship then the star that you are. Luckily, your sensations, thoughts, feelings, impressions, behaviors, etc., including a large amount those which are subconscious, provide a crucial piece of the puzzle. Indeed, we hope to join the conscious and the unconscious. Think of the paths, the sun, resh, which is the head, and the moon, cough, which is the back of the head, and the union of the conscious and unconscious that allows us to create the alchemical gold. As Phil Seckler has said, we must purify and transform all the veils that stand between us and the light of our star. So, a first step to doing this is to take inventory of these veils and search them cunningly, one of the major purposes of the diary. Now, turning to the history of the diary. The diary doesn't have a beginning in any particular historical happening or era. Its origins, aside from involving the prerequisite of literacy, are difficult to trace. But, it's been around in shifting and instructive forms. Starting with the ancient Greeks for chronological soundness, one interesting precursor to the modern diary that I believe is super relevant to one use that your magical diary can hold for you is called the Commonplace Book, first used by the ancient Greeks to sharpen their knowledge and their rhetorical prowess. Specifically, the Commonplace Book was a gathering of observations, ideas, maxims, passages, and quotations from various sources, all collected for later use to be drawn upon by the thinker, writer, orator, to polish his thinking, writing, and orating. It was source material. Indeed, many commonplace books were composed of actual passages to be not simply meditated upon, but memorized for later mention, such as an argument. Now, like the commonplace book, the diary is at least as old as the ancient Greeks, although from the outset the two have served very different purposes. One to connect the self with the community, the other to individualize the self. In his comprehensive study of autobiography and antiquity, George Misch notes that the diary impulse was already evident in the 5th century BC. In the autobiography of a Roman orator, Libanus, Misch finds diary-like passages filled with quote-unquote petty personal details. 
He also found a treatise on dreams by a guy named Synesius, in which a dream diary or a quote-unquote nightbook was recommended. Foucault suggests that Roman dream diaries, which came to be widely used, were an important step toward the description of the self. The commonplace book sort of faded, then had a renaissance in the Renaissance. Indeed, here some really interesting stuff started happening. The onset, form, and proliferation of diary writing as we better know it now, as a scrupulous recounting of the everyday, was given a major bump in the 16th and 17th centuries, owed in large part to two factors, at least in the West. The advancement of literacy on the one hand, as well as to the hearty encouragement to self-scrutinize and self-examine, coming from the Protestant Reformation. Regarding literacy, reading and writing had before been limited to the more privileged sectors of society, the rich, prestigious, and thus highly educated. However, literacy extended to the clergy and then to the laity at large. With the advancement of literacy came the widespread circulation of printed materials and the ever more common practice of silent reading. Unlike reading aloud, which had long been the only way to read, silent reading encouraged solitary reflection. It allowed the individual to form personal judgments of the surrounding world based on insights derived from books. The Protestant Reformation was a reaction against the perceived pomp and undue circumstance and depravity in Catholicism, and through it, individuals were incited to take the word of God, its interpretation, and even intercourse with God directly into their own hands. To help take care that this new, unmediated by priest communion with the divine wasn't done haphazardly, a steady barrage of instructional literature called devotional manuals flowed into the Reformed territories where this radical new type of personal piety was being cultivated. They often had names like A Method of Devotion or A Help to Devotion, which makes me think of these books as training wheels for the overarching goal of consecrating oneself to the great work, within which were pages for working out the ongoing purification as well. Readers of such manuals were prescribed a daily diet of self-examination, prayer, and meditation, and to aid with all of the above, they were highly encouraged to embark on and maintain a written account of their spiritual progress, to chart out their spiritual life's course, and to note any deviation from its path. Examples of specific purposes for these manuals were to note God's doings down and to keep them alive in memory, to give thanks, to give praise, to ask for forgiveness, Sin, report it, absolve, but adjust and self-improve, repeat. As a last point about this Protestant stuff, according to the teachings of the Reformation, it was through God's grace and not through the believer's deeds or works that one would be damned or saved. From one point of view, the doctrine of predestination could enable you, if you were of the elect to, rest in peace, being certain of your salvation. But, on the other hand, no Christian knew that he or she was indeed among the chosen few, so the only thing you could do was look for signs of grace which evidenced your election. A major way to do this was to scrutinize your life and daily conduct and uncover God's intervention in your life. From this point of view, pious conduct would be the result rather than the cause of salvation, and whatever was interpreted as God's mercy constituted additional proof of election. Hopping over for a moment to the relevance of this to Thelema, I find it exciting. In Crowley's Confessions, initially titled The Spirit of Solitude, an auto-hagiography, Crowley discusses the hand of the gods adjusting everything in his life so that his life worked out perfectly just so, an idea you also see a lot in spiritual autobiography and that could easily present itself if and when you take the task to write your own down. It also makes me think of the oath of the Magister Templi, about which Crowley laces much meditation in his magical record of John St. John. I will interpret every phenomenon as a particular dealing of God with my soul. And as a parting shot about the history of the diary, just wanted to note that Dr. John Dee would have been living and diarying around this time, in the 16th century. In addition to his spirit diaries, he also kept a more all-encompassing journal of everyday events, even visits with Queen Elizabeth scribbling entries in the margins of almanacs alongside printed data on the configuration of the stars and planets for each day. In this way, he sought to determine exactly what influence the heavens had, and as such, he was one of the first people to believe that a diary could reveal a pattern, order, and meaning in otherwise seemingly random events. Finally, I'm going to briefly review Crowley's prescriptions for use of what he's termed the magical record and some suggestions for the specifics. Crowley said to one of his dearest students, Jane Wolfe, in some of their initial correspondence when they didn't know each other circa 1920, I hope you will take the utmost pains to prepare a full magical record. 
You will find it sword and shield in the big scrap with Karanzan. He also wrote to her, I can help you to shine, star, if I can trace your orbit. Crowley's own diaries extend from his initiation into the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn in 1898 until his death in 1947. I'll be referring in spots to excerpts from Crowley's magical record of John St. John, which follows his magical retreat in Paris that was solely dedicated to the purpose of intensifying communion with his angel. It's been called a perfect model of what a magical record should be in respect of the form so far as accurate analysis and fullness are concerned. So, as an introduction or reminder to it, instructionally, in Book 4, on the chapter dedicated to the magical record called The Book, Crowley says, The book of spells or of conjurations is the record of every thought, word, and deed of the magician. For everything that he has willed is willed to a purpose. It is the same as if he had taken an oath to perform some achievement. Now, this book must be a holy book, not a scribbling book in which you jot down every piece of rubbish that comes into your head. It is written, Every breath, every word, every thought, every deed is an act of love with thee. The beat of my heart is the pendulum of love. The songs of me are the soft sighs. The thoughts of me are very rapture. And my deeds are the myriads of thy children, the stars and the atoms. Let there be nothing. Let all things drop into this ocean of love. Be this devotion a potent spell to exercise the demons of the five. Crowley also exhorts, be careful not to write nothing therein that is inharmonious or untrue. So what do you put in a magical record, and to what effect? The short answer is whatever you want that you find related to better understanding yourself and your conditions, including how they dovetail in your magical practice. So everything from the purpose of a ritual to its performance, food and mood and movie reviews reflects that moved you. To organize discussion of the specifics, let's run up the Sephiroth of the Tree of Life to write under the abyss. You might also come up with some elaborations or amendments to the scheme I'm detailing here. Malkuth. First, regarding the physical format of the record, while in Book 4, Crowley Gun, four pages made of virgin capskin, to be bound in blue leather, the leather embossed with the word the lima in gold, the pages written on with the loveliest clear script you could muster with a young male swan feather and fish ink, many formats are fine and available, from lab notebooks to word documents, so experimentation is encouraged. There are pros and cons to handwritten versus electronic. With handwritten, you have the benefit of having the magical record be supremely intimately portable, organically written in and even drawn in, and less likely to be lost, including when it's time to turn it into a teacher or chief if that's applicable, because you didn't back up the data. But don't lose the thing. Also, coming from my own experience, there seeming to be the chance that a handwritten journal is more easily consistently maintained, as leaving the physical pages that were otherwise destined for a given day blank or placed with another day becomes too harrowing a reality. However, with electronic, it has guaranteed speedability of writing, legibility, sendability, backup ability, but do backup, plus, and this is where it really shines for me, cut and paste, search and find. Also, consistency might be built from your always being on your computer with the document always open. However, with electronic formats, it's recommended that you periodically print the thing out, as technology is always changing and you don't know when your exact medium will crap out, get extinct, or be incompatible with something. As for Malkuthian content, do ground yourself in reality. What's the date? What's the time? Not only are these crucial for weaving a life history, and by the way, Crowley and many practitioners recommend that one write an autobiography, but you'll be surprised what patterns emerge from chronicity. Don't forget AM, PM, or use military time. Also, on the seemingly mundane secular level, what have you been up to? It's really helpful to be able to know some of the everyday stuff to be able to contextualize yourself at the time, events that might be affecting you, decisions you've been making, etc. in your spiritual progress. In John St. John, Crowley is quick to tell us that he's in Paris and why, and never shies away from telling us when he's about to go on a stroll, hang out with someone, and have a bath. Also, what's the weather? This may seem trivial, but weather matters. One amusing psychology study had researchers finding out that the level of overall life happiness reported by the folks they were polling around the United States significantly correlated with their local weather. Finally, what kind of food have you been eating, drugs doing, sex having, rock and roll listening? Libra Libre tells us to worship and neglect not the physical body, which is thy temporary connection with the outer and material world. You might later find out that that mass practice dragged because you forgot your triple shot of espresso. 
Let's hop over to Yesod, the sphere of the moon where we can explore our subconscious. One invaluable way to use your magical diary is in part as a dream journal. If you don't have a handwritten journal, you can leave a sort of nocturnal scratch pad next to your bed for you to jot down the important stuff before it fades from memory, to be transcribed later. Either way, in the morning when you awake, it can be useful to jot down keywords that cover the gamut of the night's dreams, so, you, so that you can make sure to hit every point as you elaborate on the narrative. David Shoemaker has relayed the notion that the elements in your dreams, even players that are people from your life, represent and confront you with different aspects of yourself, so it can be enlightening to analyze your dreams as such. The Magical Diary is also a fantastic place to learn, meditate upon, and identify in yourself, in your visions, your practice, and in your life, those symbols, archetypes, and imagery that are the language of the subconscious, such as those associated with the Ten Sephiroth or with the 22 paths that are the trumps and the tarot. Fluency with symbol is hugely important. Phil Seckler has said that the trumps can be equated with what Jung called the instinctual forces operating in the unconscious of all mankind and that the path of progressing to a more civilized and spiritual state is embarked upon specifically when we can identify and understand these forces from the unconscious in ourselves and consciously choose whether they will have much power and how much. Aside from tracking the goings-on in yourself, I think here the journal is a commonplace book like the one I mentioned earlier comes into play, compiling source material in a scrapbook, a place to log what fits together. Even to fool around with Gematria when coming up, say, with a new magical motto to get a better sense of the underlying meaning. Also, I think we all have our respective love affairs with certain symbols and metaphors, so that the magical diary is a good place to deepen your personal symbol set. In my own record, I can't tell you how many pictures and passages I've copy pasted and elaborated upon in pursuing my latest rabbit hole. Finally, for your sewed, here is a good place to either in the moment or in hindsight during review of your journal. Explore what aspects of yourself you might be denying to yourself, such as those evident in projections. At the Abbey of Thelema in Shethalu, diaries were even left around so that others could read them and, among other things, be privy to others' reactions to others and to themselves. The social world is projection central. Hode. Hode is explained by Dion Fortune as the sphere of magic, the sphere in which the magician actually works, for it is his mind that formulates the forms, that indeed, Magical capacity is the work of the intellectual imagination. Hod is the sphere of science and craft, and we can concentrate on the scientific illuminism of Thelema and that the magical diary is a lab notebook. It is through gingerly conveying results that we can learn and build from ourselves and each other, letting the standing on the shoulders of giants, at least men, happen. We want hypotheses, we want replicable experiments, imparted results, and the ongoing development of our faculty of reason and skepticism. From John St. John, even somewhat little things like pranayama, 13 cycles, very tiring, I began to sweat, a mediocre performance, are described. And then the next day, 15 cycles of pranayama put me right mentally and physically, otherwise they had little apparent success. Or in some ritual, what the hell just happened? You may not recognize some dynamics until years later. For a good highlighting of the scientific aspect of the Magical Diary, you can read over a review Lieber E, and also keep in mind Crowley's comment in Book 4 in Of the License to Depart that, Verily, it is better to fail in the magical ceremony than to fail in writing down an accurate record of it. How neat anyway to be able to go back and essentially review the most saliently perceived proceedings and effects of your first Mass, if you wrote it down, or review one of those crazy invocations you did last year. This also pertains to cataloging your intellectual reactions and interpretations to something new or old you've been reading. Also, we write down our stream of thoughts. By doing so, the record becomes a place where you can expose those inhibiting forms that your mind might impose on you. I was recently using my journals for almost eight years ago to write my autobiography and was aghast at something I found. I presently have a tendency to look upon the time of my past, especially my college years, as a golden era lived by a caliber of self that couldn't have been remotely rivaled either before or after, that it was my apex. But in my college journals, I found that the college me felt the same about the high school me, so apparently, it's just a personal myth I carry. Knowing what you bring to the table, you can proceed to discount it, no longer look at the same old interpretations as useful information, and proceed to really look around you. Finally, inasmuch as Hode corresponds to Hermes, the trickster god, 
Don't forget you can take yourself lightly in your journal and let a hearty bit of humor or comical relief shine through, if that's your way. Nutsack! At which point we're approaching the victory of light over the darkness of more hidden aspects of ourselves. Among other things, Nutsack is associated with the faculties of feeling and emotion. Like we track our thoughts, we track our emotional reactions even if they're not so pretty. This includes your underlying moods, which are the weather of your constitution on any given day that can predispose you to acute emotional reactions along their same vein. What have you been afraid of, pissed off about, enraptured with, stoked on, self-doubting over? Emotions are information about us. They come from our interpretations, further color our interpretations, and can drive our actions. There's also the idea that when you're unhappy and dissatisfied with yourself in your life, you've, as Phyllis Seckler puts it, lost the golden thread which leads to the knowledge and conversation of your holy guardian angel, for he expresses himself as joy. The diary is a helpful place to build some separation from your emotions so that you can derive benefit from looking at them. Look upon them with fascination, with self-reflection, rather than drowning in them. Maybe see later that an archetype had taken you over. This might be a good place to note that in relaying the rush of experience, you might find codification useful, to parse the rush into meaningful chunks that you can quickly make sense out of, scan, and reference. So for an emotional reaction, I start with a capital R, little x, colon, and write what's gone on. An emotional reaction can quickly turn into suspecting it's a projection, so soon there might be a capital P, little x, colon, followed with the speculation, PH for physical stuff, IX for insight, so on. Finally, note that emotions can make for extremely gilded indicators, as hinted above. We can harness them to good effect. In fact, Metzach and souls hoed. In John St. John, Crowley states that one cannot write an effective ritual till one is in a fairly exalted state. It's what gives the otherwise cold machinery of our magical engine its fuel. It also gives us glimpses of Tefereth, and we can remember that Netzach, the Nusian sphere that it is, can come into contact with any target of its adoration via the arts and rhapsody. Let's continue with rhapsody at Tefereth. Tefereth is the sphere of beauty, the seat of our sense of self, that spark of the limitless light that is our center in the circle, and that higher consciousness wherein that spark unites with our personality. I'd say it's a good place to fit rhapsody and poesy, Love sun, it's for and just invocations of your angel. There's no shortage of room for that in the record. Invoke often. Crowley does it a lot in John St. John, speaking to or about his angel toward the oncoming communion, longing for him, preparing. P.S. He also invokes coffee and oysters. But on the chapter in the book, in book four, Crowley says, Let every page of this book be filled with song, for it is a book of incantation. Tefereth is also the sphere of perfect equilibrium, and the magical diary is a good place to take inventory of all that's been mentioned above, or below as it were, and calibrating toward the equilibrium that char characterizes the sphere. Root out unbalance. Have you been super mechanically heady lately? Breathe some art into your life. Too mired in emotion? Go do something productive, get started. Here you can reconcile contrast, think the path of Samic, art, and change yourself, an imperative for any magician. Balance the microcosm so that it's suitable for elevation toward the macro. Rounding the bend below the abyss, just wanted to quickly touch on Gaborah and Chesed as dealing with two functions of the magical record, self-control for Gaborah and discerning purpose and patterns for Chesed. Gaborah belongs to Mars. Martial arts, those arts of war, require a profound amount of discipline. As a sephira of strength and severity, Gaborah touches on the magical record as a place to impart, monitor, and practice your willpower, intent, and determination, your self-control. Liber Libre says, strengthen and control the animal passions, discipline the emotions and the reason, nourish the higher aspirations. You stick to an established course in the magical record and resist deviation from it, removing your obstacles and overcoming adversity. When the tides of your personal practice are there staring you in the face, you are impelled to adjust them with energy, activity, as a warrior of Thelema fighting the good fight. Finally, Hesed is classically correspondent with memory. Going with the usual way we think of memory, in a world of surveillance and recording in which the lens is constantly upon us, I think writing is as yet still the best way to take footage of our ongoing subjective experience. There's also that more abstracted quality being memory that unifies disparate parts and perceptions into continuity, from one moment to the next as an underlying fabric. 
Nature is a continuous phenomenon. Synchronicity happens, there are patterns. And in the future, maybe long after the nuances of a ritual or working would have otherwise decayed, you may start suspecting the operation of some pattern. Were those first few days, Iao, Luke's, as Crowley wonders about in John St. John, or the long-standing presence of some motif? Armed with a new mission, you can search through your carefully kept record, panning for gold and being pleased with actually finding some, so journaling gives you fine-grained access to the past. The intersection of journaling and chesed also heavily pertains to the development of magical memory discussed in Liber Thesarb, in which two methods are offered by which a magician can better get to know himself and his purpose, tracing himself in concrete action backward toward uncovering past incarnations, or thinking in terms of backward causality toward his ultimate end. In fact, the overall exercise gone over in Liber Thesarb is meant to comprise your first page, or hundred in some cases, of your magical record. Hesed also deals crucially with the synthetic, abstracting principle that I would see with your connection with humanity at large, that which gets you to see outside yourself and extend yourself with generosity, mercy, as a benevolent good king. Ultimately, the more you put into a magical record, the more you get out of it. A good rule of thumb would be to ask yourself, if you were to pick up a book or open up a file that would allow you to read the goings-on of your life for any particular day, last week, last year, or ten years ago, what would you want to read about? What would be the most useful, the most informative, the most entertaining, the most apropos? Do that. It's the gift that literally, literally keeps on giving, as long as you keep on giving it. And in Of the License to Depart, Crowley states that it is as foolish to do magic without method as if it were anything else. To do magic without keeping a record is like trying to run a business without bookkeeping. If you call in an auditor to investigate a business, and when he asks for the books you tell him that you have not thought it worthwhile to keep any, you need not be surprised if he thinks you every kind of an ass. In closing, any time you put your pen to paper or your fingertips to keyboard, you're doing the great work. You're invoking your angel, and you're engaging in the art that is Tahuti's sanction sailing toward the silent self. So, let Tahuti standeth in splendor at the prow, and most of all, don't be an ass. <laughs> Love is the law. Love under will.